Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 23rd Annual Virtual Elder Abuse Conference, Serving Older Adults During Times of Isolation. This conference is presented by the Syracuse Area Domestic and Sexual Violence Coalition's Elder Justice Committee. My name is Lori DiCaprio Lee, and I am the ID Theft and Outreach Coordinator at Vera House. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge some recent events. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted issues of inequality. Older adults, those who live in poverty, and members of black and brown communities have been more severely impacted. The Elder Justice Committee values all older adults and stands in solidarity with the black community. We pledge to uplift the voices of black people in our community and strive to fight the injustices that have led us to this moment. Thank you. And we will now move on to other announcements. All webinars offered during this conference are free, thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to particularly recognize our platinum sponsors, Loretto, and the Onondaga County Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services. Our gold sponsors, Syracuse Jewish Family Service and Wegmans, and our silver sponsors, the Alzheimer's Association of CNY, At Home Independent Living, Community Bank, Countryside Federal Credit Union, Kraus Health, Fulton Savings Bank, Syracuse University School of Social Work, and Touching Hearts at Home. More information about all of our sponsors can be found on the Vera House website. The support of these sponsors not only funds this webinar series, but also extends beyond the conference to continue elder abuse education and prevention outreach after the event. So with that, I want to give you one last announcement before we begin. The chat feature is disabled. However, you can ask questions using the Q&A. Today's webinar is Connecting and Caring in the Community with and Without Technology. And our presenters are Jennifer Cordino, the Elder Advocate and Trainer at Vera House, Lori Klevak, Director of Senior Services at Interfaith Works of CNY, and Cynthia Carey Woods, Executive Director at Upstate Oasis. And with that, I turn it over to you. There we go. I was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, my name is Lori Klevak, and I'm the Director of Senior Services at Interfaith Works. Um, we're really excited to be talking to you about isolation and older adults and connecting with older adults um, who might be experiencing isolation at this time. So I'm going to start by just mapping out a little bit of what is, what is isolation, what are we talking about when we talk about isolation, how do people experience isolation, just to make sure we're all on the same page about that. And then my co-presenters and I are each gonna take some time to um, talk to you a little bit about the work that we do to help mitigate and decrease social isolation and help older adults be connected um, both in real time and as is even more important now um, through remote or virtual options. Um, so we'll start with some statistics. Right now in central New York, about 14% of the population is over the age of 65. And as we all know, that's because of the, the large demographic of baby boomers who are moving into you know, the 55 to 60 and up age range. Um, and that um, percentage of the population who is over the age of 65 is projected to continue to increase up to about 20%. Um, by the year 2030. And this, these, this data is really well known, um, but it's important to, to continue to reflect on that. We are an aging population. Um, next slide. 
for most people, um, the goal as we age, right, is, is to look like this, right, to have those pom-poms and to embrace aging and to experience new joy, um, to experience um, good health and longevity. And because of shifts in our society, you know, increases, in, improvements in, in um, medicine and health and wellness and how we care for ourselves, um, many people are able to live longer and live healthier. Um, this is a, a period of significant personal growth for many people. It's a period of creativity. People find new purpose. Um, they might even find ro uh, romance and adventure. Um, and, and that's what we want, right? Those of us who work in aging services, we, we want to give everybody a set of pom-poms and just help them to embrace this new stage in their life and experience as much joy as possible. Next slide. Unfortunately, we know that not everyone gets to have those pom-poms or not everyone has the pom-poms all the time. And that in the US, um, we are actually experiencing what's being called a quiet epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And studies show that about 50% of older adults report feeling loneliness at some point in their lives. 25% um, of people over the age of 65 are isolated. And this pandemic, or this, excuse me, this epidemic is particularly um, impactful for people living in long-term care facilities and nursing homes where 60% of residents uh, do not have a visitor on a regular basis. Next slide. So what are we talking about specifically when we talk about social isolation? Um, social isolation is often used to refer to two different sets of experiences. It's that loneliness, right, or the subjective experience of, I feel lonely. I don't have the quantity or quality of social relationships that I need to be satisfied and happy. So there's those subjective feelings of loneliness, but then there's the structural or objective experience of not having access to um, the things that you need to live healthy, to live well, to live as independently and to the highest degree of um, quality of life as possible. And so that might be a lack of access to caregivers, it might be a lack of access to transportation. It might be a lack of access to health care. It might be a lack of access to social supports. It might be um, a lack of access to food, lack of access to information, as so much of our information moves to digital platforms. Um, older adults can experience so, um, isolation from information. So we're really talking about those two clusters, um, the, the heading of social isolation. We're talking about the subjective experience of loneliness, but the objective experience of being isolated or having a lack of access to the things that we need to live well. Next slide. And so being socially isolated, um, there's, there's a lot of research coming out now that shows that um, being isolated is more than just a, a feeling, right? That it actually has an impact on our physical, mental, physical and mental health. And, and this set of research, I'll just point out the fact that a lot of the research around the impact of, um, of isolation on our health really deals with the subjective experience of being lonely. And so, so this data here that I'm presenting to you is, is from the UK. Um, in a study that many of us have, have heard this statistic now, being lonely can have the same impact on our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's correlated with increased risk of high blood pressure. It's correlated with an increased risk of the onset of diabetes. Um, it's also connected to our mental health and wellness. Um, so studies show that people who experience loneliness have a greater risk of cognitive decline, um, they're a greater risk of developing dementia. They're more prone to depression. Um, and it can be indicative of a risk of suicide. And then this last box here, maintaining independence, um, I think also speaks to that structural experience of lack of access, right? Um, 
you know, people who are um, experience social isolation might be more are more likely to enter a, a nursing care or a facility at an earlier age. Um, they might use accidents or emergency services more often, and so forth. Next slide. Um, some of the causes for why we're experiencing this higher rate of isolation and loneliness um, include, um, you know, the, the baby boomer generation is uh, like more likely than previous generations to have smaller families. Um, they're more likely to have moved more often or their adult children, if they have adult children, are more likely to live in an area away from them. Um, as we age, our, our social circles decrease. We lose people that we love. Um, as we age, our bodies change and we have um, often a decreased mobility. We, we might not be able to drive um, any longer or just physically getting around is a little bit more challenging. Um, and, and these things become spirals, right? I might have a, a, a new physical challenge that makes it more difficult for me to walk. And so I don't spend as much time going out and doing the things that I love and meeting the people that I enjoy spending time with. And, oh, I feel lonely, that my hip hurts more. Um, and it becomes, more, it becomes cyclical, right? It becomes, it, it becomes really cyclical. Um, the other piece of this that, um, can impact people that I don't think we talk about enough, but is, is really one of the risk factors for isolation is ageism. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, we, we are a society that values youth and prioritizes youth over aging. And um, just, you know, the, the idea that, well, I don't wanna be around old people. I'm, I'm self-isolating. I'm not going out and reaching out to um, that senior center or these activities where other people my age are because I don't wanna be around those old people. I'm not old. Um, that's a form of ageism. And ageism gets in the way of people being socially connected as well. Um, ageism is a stereotyping or a discrimination based on a person's age. So when you hear people say things like, you're too old to do that, or you're too old to learn a new skill, or it's really sad to get old, those are, those are forms of ageism. And ageism really blinds us to the benefits of aging, and it makes growing old harder than it has to be. Um, it can damage our sense of self, it segregates us, it diminishes our prospects, and it can actually shorten lives. Um, and that, that quote is from um, a woman, I think it's a woman named Ashton Applewhite, um, and you can look up the website thischairrocks.com to learn more about ageism. And, and so these are, these are some of the reasons why um, social isolation and loneliness are happening in our community. Um, I can pause right there, um, Lori, if there's any questions that have come up that might be good to answer just about social isolation and loneliness. No questions so far. Okay. So thank you. All right, so then I'll pivot to talking about um, my agency, Interfaith Works, and the work that we do um, to address isolation and, and promote connectedness in our community. So, so Interfaith Works is a nonprofit um, human services organization. We're located in um, near downtown Syracuse on James Street, and we have been doing work in central New York for um, about 44 years now. Um, we provide services to newly arrived refugees when people arrive in the U.S. Um, we help them in their first few years to um, get acclimated to their new community. Um, we do work around dialogue and ending racism. Um, we do work with faith communities in the area um, to promote inter you know, interfaith understanding and, and connection. And we have our senior services programming. You can go to the next slide. And our C, the, the goal or the mission of our senior services department is to um, empower older adults to stay active, socially connected, and to age with dignity. Um, to really start to break those cycles of isolation and loneliness that people are experiencing, help them find um, opportunities that they benefit from, whether it's social opportunities or um, the support that they need to engage in the community and, and, and in their social circles the way that they want to again. And so our longest running program is the Senior Companion Program. This is a volunteer-based program. We recruit older adults to serve as in-home companions 
for frail elders and homebound older adults, people who want to stay independent and live in their own homes, but need extra support to be able to do that. And so I, I sort of describe it as our senior companions will do all the things that a family member or a neighbor might do, like, um, you know, go through your mail, um, with you or have a good conversation, play a game, watch a, watch a show together, get that high thing down off the shelf. Um, but, but these people that we serve, they don't have that person in their lives. And so the volunteers will provide at least four hours of free companionship every week um, or more. Um, during this period of, of COVID-19, we're exploring remote ways that senior companions can continue to serve. Um, and the great thing about the senior companion program is the volunteers themselves are all older adults. Um, they are all over the age of 55. And so this provides them with a rewarding and engaging service opportunity. These are active older adults who um, want to give back to their community and continue to serve their peers. Um, and these volunteers all receive a stipend to help offset the cost of volunteering and, and help them to engage in their volunteer opportunities. Similar to the Senior Companion Program, we have a program called One to One, and this recruits volunteers to serve specifically in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. So our, companion, our Senior Companions are about helping people to stay independent in their own homes, but as we noted earlier, people living in nursing homes and long-term care facilities experience loneliness at a really high, de high degree. About 60% don't have visitors on a regular basis. And so our One to One volunteers are people from any age any age group who can give at least an hour a week to provide friendly visits and we match people one-on-one. -on -one. So one volunteer gets matched with one resident to form a really close and supportive friend friendship and relationship that we hope will last over time. Right now that's being done through phone calls and we do have volunteers who are um, available to connect with people for phone calls. Um, but during um, non-COVID times, those are one, one, once a week in-person visits. And then our last set of programming is specifically designed to meet the needs of older refugees. So older refugees face all of the same challenges that um, people born in the U.S. or people who have aged in the U.S. face, with the additional challenge often of a language barrier and a lack of knowledge about what is even happening in this community and where are the opportunities for me to get engaged and what do I know and how can I learn about the community. And so we have English classes that are specifically designed for the older adults to work at their pace and help them learn conversational English um, in a way that's meaningful to them. And then we have a series of social events and activities that we do, um, might be a field trip, an exercise class, um, to help them learn about their community, help them learn about keeping themselves healthy and well, and learn about the resources that are available in their new community um, so that they can be active and as engaged and have those opportunities as well. Lori, before we go on to the next slide, we did have a question, and I'm not sure if this is, this is the time when you want to answer it. Okay. Um, but it is, can you give an example of some ways your senior companions are working remotely? So that's a great question. Our senior companions have actually been, um, we've, we've suspended activities, but are getting them back up to service in early July. Um, they will definitely be making uh, calls every week to the people that they currently serve and, and you know, we can take referrals for new calls. So it will primarily look like um, friendly calls um, with um, some support to engage in, in remote activities. Um, we're also exploring um, the opportunity to do, um, you know, maybe running errands. Um, we can't, we're not doing any in-person visits, so no in-car transportation or in-home visits, but um, they can certainly run to the grocery store and pick up some groceries or, you know, run to the library or run to the, the drug store and pick up prescriptions. Um, and um, we are exploring other ways that they might be able to provide, you know, engage in, in you know, virtual activities together. Maybe they're going to join a class that Cindy will talk about in a few minutes. You know, maybe they can join that class together and we can um, support their learning new technology as well, because technology is a big barrier right now.
Thanks, Lori, for the background on, on isolation and aging. Um, I'm Cynthia Carey Woods, the Executive Director for Oasis. Um, and we can go ahead and click to the next slide. So I took over this position at Oasis about almost four years ago. And when I started, the one thing I kept hearing was that Oasis was the best kept secret in, in the community. People were here, the people that were here loved the program, but if they weren't here, they would mention it to their neighbors and, and they might hear, gee, I don't even know what that is. Can you tell me more? So um, let's go to the next slide and we'll start digging into what this is. If I were to describe Oasis, I would say in a nutshell, it provides opportunities for personal growth, new purpose, adventure, and keeping people connected. A lot of the things that uh, Lori just spoke of as it relates to isolation, um, in a lot of ways, this program could be seen almost as a panacea for some of those issues. Next slide. I don't typically love to read off the slides, but there's a lot of information on this slide and I wanna give you a little bit of a uh, background. So OASIS is a national nonprofit membership education organization designed to enrich the lives of older adults. It strengthens communities by providing lifelong learning and service opportunities that inspire diverse audiences of people over 50 to pursue vibrant, healthy, productive, and meaningful lives. We impact lives through partnerships and share knowledge. We offer evidence-based programs, we conduct evaluations, and we are constantly adapting to meet the needs of our diverse audiences. Now, locally, we are um, sponsored by Upstate Medical University, and some of our partner agencies include the Office for Aging, Southside Innovation Center, the local community libraries. Uh, we work with many of the community centers in the city and in the outlying areas. Uh, we have a wonderful relationship with Syracuse Housing Authority. I'm working right now on some projects with the Salvation Army, just to name a few. And interestingly enough, when Lori and I started working, which is primarily, I'm sure, the reason that I was kind of looped into this discussion, um, we started talking about ways to collaborate. And, and we went directly to technology, which is what she just spoke of about the, the needs for technology in our community. And our um, OASIS program actually offers a connections technology program that's specifically created for older adults and for newcomers to technology. And again, that's, that's many of the people who attend programming here and many of the people that Lori work, works with. Next slide. So a little bit of history behind Oasis. The founder, Marilyn Mann, was approaching retirement and she just happened to be best friends with the wife of the owner of the May department stores. And you may or may not know that May was the parent company of stores like Macy's. And so they kind of got together and they walked around and they decided, well, they went around checking out what was available to them in retirement. And what they found were people who were maybe sitting in senior centers, not really active, you know, maybe a little shuffleboard here and some pinochle there but it wasn't really uh, stimulating and they didn't find it to be anything uh, worth pursuing. So they said, we know, we know we can do better than this for people aging into retirement and beyond. So they put their heads together and recruited some of their professor friends and they started to create programming of interest to uh, people over 50 and they went back to um, the owner of the May department stores and says, we have this great idea and we're going to use the community rooms in your department stores. So that's how Oasis got started. It was in the community rooms of many of the May and Macy's department stores. And that allowed expansion across the nation to the area where those areas where those uh, stores were located. So currently across the United States, we have nine sites that stand alone. We have our main site in St. Louis. Uh, Washington, D.C., Indianapolis, upstate New York is actually lucky enough to have two centers, one in Rochester, one in Syracuse. We have one in San Antonio, Albuquerque, San Diego, and Los Angeles. Next slide. So that was in the, the early 80s. Fast forward to 1998, and there was the uh, very large MacArthur Foundation study of aging in America. 
And that was in 1998, and it identified three key ingredients pre for preserving a high quality of life as we age. And those three ingredients were maintaining a low risk for disease, a high level of engagement with one's community, high physical and cognitive function, and they noted most importantly that it's actually the combination of all three of those that represents the concept of successful aging. And so, next slide. OASIS offers essentially those three key ingredients. For the cognitive function, we have many lifelong learning programs. Um, our, we have, well, right now, Obviously, we're doing much of our stuff remotely. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we work with on-site and off-site locations to offer programs in history and languages and current affairs and visual and performing arts. There's financial courses, uh, legal issues. We, we have some writing classes. Um, there's travel opportunities. And the nice thing about it is you can sign up for a travel opportunity um, and if you're someone who, like me, travels essentially alone, it's nice to be traveling with people who you either know from Oasis or are like-minded and on the same trip with you. So you never are really alone. Um, we talked a little bit about connection, and I think it's important, or technology, I'm sorry, the Connections Program. And it's important to know, I think, that Syracuse is on the list of the 10th most digitally divided cities in the country. And that's important because as people who are older now don't have access to technology or don't understand technology, this is a point in time where you're gonna see people become more isolated and more disconnected if they don't get a handle on some of the, the technology that's available. Many of the resources we offer to the community are now online, so folks need to understand how to use that technology and access the services that are available to them. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Fees for classes range from free to reasonable, but the good news is we had a donor step up and offer a scholarship fund, which is available because she was interested in sharing her love of Oasis with people who may not have the funding to do it or maybe on fixed income. So that's a really great benefit that we're able to offer as well. <clears throat> Additionally, a second donor stepped up and offered funding for a concert series. So we now have uh, free high quality concerts that we can offer to the public. Um, and it happens about six times a year and they're available at no charge because he wanted to share his love of music as well. So when we can reconvene, we'll get back to offering our concerts um, for folks. Next slide. For the physical function piece of those key ingredients, uh, we offer health and wellness classes in addition to the standard uh, fitness classes like yoga and um, some tight and tone weightlifting classes, Zumba. We have a dance for Parkinson's disease. Um, but we also provide uh, the Stanford University evidence-based health programs to help people live their best lives. These are classes that are peer-led, so we train folks in the community to take these classes back to their communities. This works especially well in underserved areas. Um, we use a lot of members of faith communities to take them back to their congregations. It's been a really great fit um, because people tend to really trust who they know and they may not trust me coming in to give that information to them, but if I train one of their church members and they take it back to them, it's much more likely to be embraced and accepted. Um, those evidence-based programs, I kind of listed them with acronyms here, are chronic disease self-management, chronic pain self-management, which is really important right now with uh, some of the opioid issues that we're facing, diabetes self-management, um, Tai Chi for arthritis and falls prevention, and matter of balance. So um, falls are actually one of the number one traumas we see in our emergency room. And so we've partnered with our trauma department to start offering some classes in falls prevention and falls awareness. So again, all of these are developed to help you live your best life, no matter what situations, uh, what kind of chronic conditions you're facing. Next slide. For the engagement in one's community ingredient, we offer several opportunities to volunteer. Um, we are, and I'm especially proud of, our intergenerational tutoring program. 
When I started, we had about 22 tutors. We now have close to 150 tutors volunteering once a week to go into grades K through three. Um, we're in five different districts, including Syracuse City, Liverpool, Central Square, Marcellus, and Jordan Albridge. Um, they go in and work with students for about an hour a week, and it's really dedicated toward uh, literacy skills because we know if kids can't read by grade three, they're very likely to get left behind in school for, from that point forward. Um, so it's been really, it, it, it's a really great opportunity to make connections and it's so meaningful to the kids to have that regular person showing up once a week. And for some kids, it's really often the one constant they have in their lives. So there's some really great connections being made there for the, for the tutors that are offering this, this service. And then CDSMP, again, like I said, you can be a volunteer who's trained to be a peer leader and then take those evidence-based programs back to your community. Um, Volunteer service, uh, services also happen here at our site. We have volunteer instructors, so if you know someone who has a particular interest and wants to share it as a class, please reach out to me. We'd be happy to uh, have them come in and be interviewed and work with our program coordinator. We have folks who are class coordinators and help with technology. We have people um, who take our catalogs around to different spots in the community. We have 11 members who act as leadership team um, leaders. And so they help us actually run the center and sit at our, our um, welcome desk and they answer the phone, they train other volunteers. They actually provide almost two FTEs and help us in ways that um, we can never thank them enough for. Um, if you know anyone who's interested in volunteering, send them our way. And the beauty of it is in each of these capacities, there's ample amounts of training so that people don't have to come in and say, what am I gonna do? I, I don't know what this op opportunity is gonna look like for me. I can, they're all trained and they know exactly um, how to do the function that they've signed up for. And I'm actually really pleased to say that um, that little inset, that picture is one of our tutors who is working with a group of kids right there. So it's a really great program and opportunity to give back. Next slide. Before you move on, I just, um, I think you just touched on this. There was a question that just came up. Would you be willing to share some of the materials and methods you use to recruit volunteers for these programs? Um, a lot of it is done with uh, word of mouth and we put a lot of, um, so we advertise in the back of 55 plus, we send information out to all of our upstate retirees as the largest employer um, with upwards of, I think it's over 10,000 employees now. When people retire, we send the information packets out to them. Um, having sessions like this helps get the word out that we have opportunities for people. So. Um, you know, those are some of probably the most important ways. We do have a couple of volunteers who act as community speakers and we'll go out to senior groups and talk to them about uh, the opportunities that, that we have for volunteerism. So those are some of probably the most popular ways that we do our recruiting. Any other questions? Um, okay, I'm saving some for the end, so it's a good time. Okay, to okay. <laughs> so, so all of what I've discussed up to this point is pretty much on point for what we did prior to COVID-19. So just to give you a little context here, um, when we, um, we had about four hours notice here in the center to essentially grab what we needed to go home and do our work from home. Now, luckily, we were on our trimester break. So we operate on trimesters. So uh, we were between the winter, spring, and the summer trimester. So we had about three weeks where we could um, move our stuff home. And literally on the way home, I was on the phone with the upstate education communications people saying, I need Zoom licenses so that we can convert to online Zoom classes. And then we were really lucky to have one of our most popular speakers 
um, who's also the chair of our education committee say, yes, I will help with this. So he offered some classes on Zoom so that he could learn it and that we could engage as many people as possible to the Zoom platform to get a sense of how it worked, that it worked, and that they could still take their classes. Um, and that I think was a huge uh, benefit to all of our members because we would have classes upwards of 150 people giving them experience on Zoom so that they could feel comfortable paying to take a class uh, when the next trimester began. Um, we also were in the middle of Tai Chi for arthritis and a chronic disease program. And my coordinator for those programs reached out and none of the folks who were taking the class at the time wanted to just quit at that point. So she personally took it upon herself to kind of train everyone in how to use Zoom. And they managed to move forward and continue those classes in an online Zoom format as well. So we have um, currently seven Zoom licenses that we juggle around to manage all of our class, classwork, our meetings. Um, and, and it's so far worked pretty well. Moving forward, because we aren't sure what's gonna happen with the uh, school situation in the fall. In fact, we're still working on when we can, when and if we can reconvene with in-person programming. And it's looking like um, we've asked all our, our fall instructors to plan to pivot, be able to pivot quickly. If you are offering a class, it also needs to be something that we can do through Zoom. So if we have to, you know, if we do get the opportunity to come back and have in-person classes, we'll also be able to go ahead and offer them um, online if we have to go back to remote learning. Um, the other part of that is because of social distancing in some of our larger classes, we're going to have to offer hybrid program programming so that people who can't get into the room can actually still take the class. But what happens if you don't have internet and if you don't have access to those things? Next slide. We have uh, a conversations that count account uh, program that is something that the National Oasis helps us with and is a program that they offer us um, that we can extend to the community. Essentially, Oasis provides training and materials and then outlines group topics. And there are upwards of 57, I think, different weekly topics. So the, a person could be trained to manage this conference line is for about 10 to 12 people. And they would just get on the phone and talk about whatever the subject is. And it could be eating as we age. Some of the other uh, topics are the power of laughter, preserving family history, how to spice up your regular routine, uh, seasons of change, topics like that where people can just come together and talk a little bit. And for many people, this is the one opportunity to have that phone call once a week. It's the one time they might actually really be connecting with people in similar situations and feeling less alone. So um, this was one of the topics when I originally started talking to Lori, we tossed around as an, op an option for people who aren't connected or don't have the means to have technology in their homes. Next slide. And I'm excited about this just this week, just uh, today's Wednesday. So two days ago, we launched Oasis Everywhere, which is essentially our 10th um, site, but this is a virtual site. So each of the nine centers provide their best content in one virtual location. So there is a website where you can go um, through, kind of scroll through the content that's offered. We have a couple history classes that we're providing. Uh, there's a travel class. Uh, there's classes on how to use Zoom efficiently. There's an ageism class, uh, all kinds of content, but it's so neat because we have, you know, the Albuquerque site can provide um, Native American stuff. DC might be able to provide some more um, Supreme Court kinds of discussions. It's just a really great opportunity for all of us to share some of our highlighted content. And that went live again, that went live this week. So really, really exciting news for us. Next slide. And this is a picture of two of our volunteers working together at our front desk. And I listed the, the website there. Um, for anyone that wants more information. And if anyone has questions that are pertinent now, I'm happy to take them. I think we're good to move on right now. Okay. Okay, that means I'm up. 
So thank you everybody for being part of today's webinar. Um, I wanted to quickly just kind of overcap uh, what it is that Evergreen Network does, and that is that Evergreen addresses elder abuse, neglect, financial exploitation uh, throughout Onondaga County. And this is done through direct services to older adults, through training and outreach and community collaboration, which you will all get to see in just a second here. Uh, but again, my name is Jennifer Corradino. I am the uh, elder advocate here at Vera House. So people who are 50 and older uh, get referred to me and we work on uh, a variety of different elder abuse topics. So in order to demonstrate what we've been talking quite a bit about uh, through collaboration is uh, I'm going to read off a case study for everybody and then my co-facilitators today are going to jump in uh, and start to kind of fill in some of these uh, gaps that need to be addressed. So for the case study, Jane Doe, 83, fell in the summer of 2019. The hospital said that because of her health, they wanted her to go to a rehabilitative nursing home program, or she could go home and live with her daughter, Karen, her son-in-law, and her grandson. Jane chose to go live with her family. Jane's daughter, Karen, became financially and verbally abusive. They put up cameras and would yell at Jane constantly if they saw her outside of her bedroom located in the basement. They took her money and said it was for the cost of her staying with them. Her grandson would clean the family guns and warn Jane that she is not to have visitors. Jane reached out to APS, which involved Vera House, to help Jane get to safety. Jane was self-advocating that she wanted to return to her own home. Together as a team, we were successfully able to get Jane back to her home, but now we have a new issue. And based on the topic of today, I'm sure that a lot of people can assume that it is social isolation. So now she's isolated. Jane does know how to use her home phone, but she doesn't own a smartphone. She doesn't really know how to navigate a computer. She has a car, but she doesn't always feel comfortable with driving because of her mild cognitive impairment. So with these new issues that pop up, we wanna make sure that people are able to remain safe. And throughout the course of today's webinar, we had touched upon all different programs uh, that perhaps can uh, help. So I am going to lean into my colleagues through a collaboration. And just so everybody is aware, this is actually a true story, but uh, we've changed the names and different information, so there is no identifying factors uh, left in here. Um, so we're gonna lean into uh, Lori and Cynthia just to touch upon what do we think? How can we take somebody who is isolated in our community and get her the help that she needs? Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I think um, Jane, right? That's what we're calling her. Yep. Jane would be a great candidate to have a senior companion. Um, a senior companion could come to her home um, at least four hours a week, but um, depending on her interests and the availability of the senior companion, um, the senior companion could come every day for several hours and, and visit with Jane um, and they could um, just share a friendship right? Develop a new friendship and share some hobbies together. Um, they could go out and do some local errands together. Um, the senior companion is able to um, drive the people, the, the, their clients, and, and we do carry some insurance to, um, you know, cover any risks with that. And so the senior companion, they could go and, um, you know, make a visit together or get, do some errands. Um, and then if we had a senior companion that was a little tech savvy or tech curious, um, they could work together to explore and expand their own knowledge of um, using technology. So at this point in time, right, while we're all staying at home, um, you know, they could, they could explore some, some of those opportunities together. Um, senior companions are also trained to know, um, to, to identify red flags. Um, and um, skills of independent living. So um, senior companions get training from Beer House on signs of elder abuse and neglect, 
Um, they get trained by the Alzheimer's Association to understand, you know, what is the experience of cognitive decline and what should they be looking out for and how can they communicate effectively with people who are experiencing that decline. Um, we, we, they get training every month and so um, they know about resources and information in the community that they can bring back to clients to help them to live well and independently. And so, yeah, I think Jane would be a great candidate for a senior companion. And I think uh, if, if we could kind of piggyback on that a little bit, as far as the senior companions being a little bit tech savvy, that's something that we could help with. So at Oasis, we could help train the senior companion to be a little more tech savvy, or one of those trips out and about during the week could be over to Oasis to learn the technology, either learn about smartphones, um, we have, like I said, the scholarships available. So if it was someone that couldn't afford or didn't have the money available to afford a class, they could come over and take a class. We could do the scholarship program through that. Um, so um, we could easily either train the, the companion to go back and teach, the, the, teach Jane, or we could bring Jane over here where she might make more connections and maybe find a way to um, get here to potentially volunteer. Uh, again, that's keeping her connected, keeping her purpose filled. Uh, and then she can see kind of what other classes we also offer. She may find value in some of the evidence-based programs that help live your best life. Um, and I think if I recall, you said she fell and that's what eventually put her in the hospital initially. So someone could help her with, um, learning the falls prevention programming or come and she could take the falls prevention falls awareness programs to prevent that from happening happening again um i think too we could um if she didn't want to travel out for whatever reason we have our conversations that count um call that she could get on and touch base with people and keep her connected in kind of a low tech way where those folks too would be kind of keeping an ear open for those red flags if they hear something in the conversation that might need to be reported out to more of an authority. Um, those are some options that we could certainly help with. Sure, that's awesome. And I think that, you know, th there's this emphasis on what we were just able to do and just demonstrate with our case study as far as collaborating. And I think that when you become aware of what services exist in your community, you're definitely more able to assist when these red flags pop up and how can we teamwork this to make sure that all the individual's needs are met. And certainly these programs feel like they would be a really good fit for Jane. Uh, the last thing that I wanna touch on is, so we have a case like Jane, so how might somebody like I or different professionals in the area uh, make referrals? How can we get Jane involved or reach out to you guys? Um. Yeah, you can contact our senior services department. Um, our imp contact information is on the website. Um, Lori DiCaprio Lee, are you sharing our contact information? Should I just say it right now? Go ahead and say it. And is it okay. on the last slide, maybe? And if it's not, if anyone okay. knows, they can email me. So, um, folks who may benefit from a senior companion can. Um, Contact actually our, our, our volunteer coordinator. Her name is Jessica Delutis, D E L U T I S. And her phone number is 315 449 3552, extension 110. Or her, um, sorry, working from home. Here. Okay. Um, or her um, email is jdelutis, J-D-E-L-U-T-I-S at I-F-W-C-N-Y. So the initials for Interfaith Works, I-F-W-C-N-Y dot org. And for Thank us, you. You can call our Oasis front desk. We still have uh, folks answering the phones and taking messages. Our number is 315-464-6555. Again, it's 315-464-6555. If you have a specific kind of programmatic question, um, it's probably easiest just to reach out to me directly. And my email is Carrie C, C A R Y C at upstate.edu. 
again, C-A-R-Y-C at upstate.edu. We actually have a few specific questions about some of your programs. So if it's okay, I'll ask them now. Um, sure. Lori Kleback, is the Senior Companion Program available in Cicero, Liverpool, or North Syracuse? Yes. We serve in Onondaga, Cayuga, and Madison counties. Okay. But I, I should, so yes, yes. So those are our service areas. Um, and we work um, to make matches. Um, it's really, we, we call it, we, we think of it as kind of like a love connection. Um, because let's be honest, if someone's going to be spending that much time with you, you really want to like them and vice versa. Um, and so we, we're really careful about, you know, what, what are the needs and interests of the person requesting a senior companion and what are the skills and um, the interests of the volunteer and, and who, can we, who can we bring together for a really meaningful and supportive relationship. Um, but we are able to serve in those areas. Okay, thank you. Another question, can you all help with smart technologies like the ring doorbell, security cameras, et cetera, to help the client feel safe and independent? Hmm. Theoretically, a senior companion could help with those things. It would just depend on whether the senior companion um, knew how to do that. I think if we had a, a client who was requesting help with that and the senior companion, we knew about it, we might reach out to our broader network of, of volunteers and, and community members, people like Cindy, and say like, hey, we have this correct request, what can we do? But it's not necessarily a service that we provide. It would be kind of an opportunity to explore um, how can we connect this person with some other knowledgeable volunteers? Okay, this one is specifically for Cindy. Is transportation available to Oasis? Um, it, there are transportation um, options in the community. We do not provide transportation, which is kind of a limiting factor, but that's where we can partner with, you know, someone like Lori to have a senior companion maybe bring them. I do have a couple volunteers that come by call of us. Um, so there are some options, but we at Oasis do not provide transportation. Okay. But you're also, Cindy, if I can, to, to get over, you have done some things to overcome that transportation by like partnering with community centers and making sure that they're available in lots of different areas, right? Right, and so a lot of, a lot of that, programming happens in community centers so people don't have to travel. Um, for example, we do some, a lot of stuff that we, some of the programs we offer right at locations for Syracuse housing because a lot of those folks have transportation issues. So um, I think if there's a need, it would be worth a discussion about how we can maybe get the programming there. And with our newfound expertise in uh, Zoom, we could probably be there albeit remotely, but in a location where people wouldn't have to travel. I have to unmute myself, sorry. Uh, Cindy, another one for you. Can Cynthia expand more on the membership fee referred to as reasonable? And are there specific requirements for the scholarship funding that you can share with us? Um, so far with the, with the scholarship, it's a new enough uh, process that we're kind of taking it on an individual by individual basis. So um, essentially the person calls and talks to me, gives me a little bit of background and, and we work through some of the details. In some cases we may have people pay what they can. So they have a little skin in the game, if you will, and will show up and actually occupy a space um, and in other cases, it's just not feasible. So, you know, we offer them the scholarship. Um, it's not in perpetuity. We can't offer this forever, but we do um, the best that we can to, to help as many people as we can. Um, as far as the requirements for membership, it's free to be a member. Um, there are many of the health programs that we offer are free. Um, most classes, you know, depending on whether it's a series, it's hard to say because some, some, some classes are 11 weeks. They meet, you know, every week at the same time for a couple hours. It, a lot depends on how long the class is. Um, you might get a one-time art class, whereas you might have an 11-week history class. So generally speaking, um, 
very reasonably priced compared to other options in the area. Um, you know, I would say without looking, and I hate to quote this, but maybe six to eight dollars per session would be kind of a ballpark range. Okay, thanks. And one more question came in. Um, it's about ageism. Could Lori or others comment on the ageism reflected in it being implied now that seniors' lives are less valuable in the midst of this mm -hmm. pandemic? Has been hurtful to many that some in our society seem to find it's okay if seniors get COVID-19. That's such a heavy question. I just have to jump in there and say that, but you're, it's definitely something that has been noticed. And I think that all of us professionals have noticed this as well, but yeah, that, that's a very heavy question. I, I, I don't have anything profound. I mean, it's very profoundly written and I, I um, appreciate the, the, you know, the anonymous attendee who who just put that out there for all to just take a moment to think about it. I mean, I've I've heard it from people that I love, right? People that I love very much who have said, "Eh, I've lived my life. If I get it, I get it." And I'm like, "No, <laughs> you matter. Like you you know like." Um, so I. Um, I think on the flip of that too, and perhaps the, the person who's asking the question was referring to, um, you know, a lot of uh, the attention towards like wanting to come out of quarantine and well, these people can just stay in quarantine and mm -hmm. and they can continue to isolate, right? Yeah. And this whole entire presentation yeah. has been about isolation and, um, but it doesn't matter. And if they get sick, well, they, they lived a full life yeah. and kind of that mentality of ageism and, I think that's something that's just really important is when you see these things, you should confront that type of thinking and have an open dialogue to really understand what is it that makes somebody feel this way. But, and, and perhaps they don't know somebody with an underlying condition or who are older and therefore they, they feel a little bit detached. But for many of us with people who are older in our lives or who with underlying conditions, this has been a very scary and very trying time. And so I think that just the encouragement to open dialogue and have some of these conversations to really understand where that ageism is stemming from so that you can, you know, face it head on. And, and I think, I mean, in my world, we, we work so closely with so many older adults that I feel like um, even I would say, we, you know, I feel more protective because it, they're such a resource and there's so much richness and wisdom that they share among themselves that, that they bring to the table for all of us to learn from. So I'm, you know, I, I feel pretty respectful of the fact that we need to protect them and, and much of the programming we're doing remotely now is because they are so valued to us that we want to make sure they stay safe being in that more vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So we have two minutes left and we have one last question for Jenny C. Um, it is, how are you able to serve clients during this time of COVID-19? So that's a good question. Uh, so certainly connecting over the phone, uh, the support group that we run was done virtually um, and we are starting to explore meeting with six feet dif uh, distance, wearing masks at uh, different parks throughout the area to be able to gather and have that, um, some more of that social gathering for people who are comfortable. Um, but certainly it, it's taken a lot of phone conversations, a lot of emails and a lot of safety planning uh, just to make sure that people feel comfortable with connecting with us and making sure that we can carve out a time and a space that is best for them. Um, so it's definitely required a lot of flexibility with scheduling and perhaps hours, um, but it has been trying, but we are still here. We are still taking phone calls, staying connected and doing the best we can, uh, considering that a lot of people who are facing these issues are stuck home with their abusers. 
Thank you. So we have a minute left. Any last closing thoughts? No more. We've answered all the questions. So thank you for that. Any last closing thoughts? I think for, for me, I think a lot of what we can do together is really based on awareness of programming. And if nothing else, I feel like, you know, we brought some more awareness to what it is that each of us does for the community and how we can work together to make it more impactful. I, I want to echo that. And I, I think that I want to just say thank you to everybody for being willing to participate today. And I hope that everybody was at least able to learn a little bit about uh, what each of our organizations are capable of doing. And again, if you see something, uh, don't be afraid to say something or to reach out and collaborate because that's what we're all here for. Um, and I'll just take this opportunity to say, you know, from the Vantage of the Senior Companion Program, we are still figuring out what service looks like in a COVID-19 world. So I have no idea who's attending this, this right now, who's listening, but if you are with an organization that welcomes volunteers and you have a need for volunteers and you want to explore ways that older adults might be able to support you or support your work with older adults, please reach out to me. Um, because I would love to at least have a conversation about how a senior companion might be able to support the work that you do supporting older adults in the community. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank our presenters. That was some really great, useful information. So Jenny C, Cindy, Lori, thank you very much for being with us. Also thanks to Tessa, our sign language interpreter. So um, with that, I'm going to close this. And um, again, just thank you to everyone who participated. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.